a little bit tough on those days when our technical staff is not able to be with us. Appreciate your prayers for Megaly. Uh, she's down with uh, Judy's brother and his wife and their daughter uh, taking care of Grandma because uh, Stan's wife Joan had to fly out to the West Coast because her brother called and said that the father is dying. And uh, so uh, the daughter needed some help with uh, taking care of Grandma. Those of you who remember the situation when Grandma was here uh, know that uh, it took quite a bit of effort uh, to lift her up in an electric lift, get her in the wheelchair, get her around, bring her to church, and take care of her during the week. And so uh, <laughs> Megaly's cousin is having a difficult time with that. So Megaly went down to, to spend uh, the next week or so with them while Aunt Joan is out on the West Coast. So appreciate your prayers uh, for them as they are caring for her. Now please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago. Out of the book of Exodus, some very sobering thoughts as we begin to move into this final segment of the plagues that God sent on Egypt. We're in Exodus chapter 10. You may recall last week we finished off the study on the plague of hail, hail to the chief part two, and uh, at the end of that plague, Pharaoh had decided that he was going to be a tough guy and that tough guys could probably hold out just a little bit longer because when the hail stopped, he figured everything is okay. It won't start up again. Now, of course, it was true that the hail had destroyed all of the crops that had already grown up at that time, the flax and the barley, but the hail, it specifically told us, had not yet destroyed the wheat and the rye because they were just getting ready to spring up, but they hadn't gotten up yet. So, Pharaoh sort of stuck his nose up at God and said, Okay, God, so what are you going to do about that? I have a question for you. I think it applies to every one of us here. Have you ever known somebody who was really stubborn? Everybody who's known somebody who was really stubborn, please raise your hand. Yeah. If there's somebody here who's never known anybody who is really stubborn, you have had an amazingly wonderful life. <laughs> I think we've all known somebody who was really stubborn, right? Somebody who absolutely refused to submit to authority. Somebody who always, without exception, insisted on doing things their own way. Did you ever have a brother or sister like that? And everybody out there who had a brother or sister is all nodding. Yes, that was my brother and that was my sister. They're the ones that were stubborn. They always wanted to do everything their own way. Uh, did any of you ever have any children who were like that? And I'll stand up here in the pulpit and I'll yes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not going to tell you which ones, but um, <laughs> out of 13, you can take your guess, and you might get pretty close. <laughs> yes, uh, then the question, were you ever like that? And I think if we're honest, there have been times in our life when every one of us has been like that. Every one of us has been sort of like Pharaoh was here in this passage. But we need to remember how God views it. And that's why we're moving into these final three stages of judgment here with the locusts and then the darkness and then the death. We need to remember what God thinks about stubbornness and rebellion. First Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity. That's moral impurity. Iniquity and idolatry bowing down in those funny little statues made out of gold and silver and wood and what stupidity but God hates it because you're worshiping something besides him rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king now that was Saul but because Pharaoh rejected the word of the Lord Pharaoh's firstborn got killed and Pharaoh's land was destroyed. Friends, we have to be very careful that we do not reject the word of the Lord. When God gives us his word, he expects obedience. He does not tolerate stubbornness. He does not tolerate rebellion. 
It never occurred to Pharaoh, I suppose, that if God had wanted to kill Pharaoh outright, he could have done it with a snap of his fingers. Pharaoh, you're dead. Can you imagine that? This guy is watching all these plagues going on. He's seeing people and animals get killed. He's seeing his land utterly devastated and destroyed. And he still sits up there and shakes his fist at God. If God had wanted to, God could have sent one of those big hailstones straight through the roof of Pharaoh's palace and hit him squarely on the noggin. Put him out of commission for the remainder of eternity. Bingo! There's the end of Pharaoh. That helps you understand that what God is doing, he's not only judging, but he is showing mercy. He's giving Pharaoh ten opportunities to repent. That's the mercy of God. God could have killed him in the first plague. He said, look, I told you to let my people go. You're a dead man. Now, all the rest of my people, you can get up and get out of here. I'm paralyzing everybody else in Egypt. None of them can move. Just pick up your stuff and get moving and pick up whatever you want. Go into your neighbor's houses. They're going to get all that stuff in the end anyway. When they leave, they're going to go to their neighbors and their neighbors are going to give them gold and jewels and all kinds of stuff. You know, God could have skipped all the stuff that we see in the plagues. He could have just killed Pharaoh let the children of Israel go with everything that they wanted to take. He could have gotten them out there. They would have never been chased by chariots. God could have opened the Red Sea just like he did. They could have gotten on a cross and never had to worry about Pharaoh and his army at all. But God chose not to do it that way because God was showing mercy on Pharaoh and on the Egyptians. Those wretched, stubborn, rebellious, recalcitrant, obnoxious, vicious people. He was giving them the opportunity to repent. How often has God worked in your life and you've refused to repent? You've decided you're going to do it your way anyway. It doesn't matter what God says about it. You're going to do it your way. Do you understand? God showed mercy on Pharaoh. Pharaoh was getting spanked, but Pharaoh refused to break. I've known some kids like that, not in my family, praise the Lord, but I've known some kids that, you know, their parents spank them just to, like the Bible says they're supposed to do, and they just get put their lips together and they will not say, I'm sorry, or, you know, I know of a fellow who told the story of a little boy who got his spanking and was made to sit in the corner had to sit on a little chair in the corner and his parents heard him mutter, well, I may be sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm still standing up. <laughs> Sad. Sad. That's how some people are. I hope you're not like that. Because God is bigger than you are. Pharaoh didn't catch on. But God is bigger than you are. And when God wants to crush you, if you're a rebel... He may give you a long time. Don't you realize, says Paul, that the long-suffering of God leads you to repentance? The long-suffering of God leads you to repentance? God's giving Pharaoh the option of grace instead of killing him right off like he could have done. You know, but Pharaoh is um, sort of like most people in the world. He probably thought very little about God, and he thought way too much of himself. He refused to think reasonably about his own... Now, he thought about his death, but he didn't think reasonably about his death. We know he thought about his death. Think of all the monuments in Egypt. Think about the pyramids. Think about the Valley of the Kings down near Luxor and Thebes in Karnak. That's 480 miles south down along the river. And that's where the land of Goshen was, by the way, not up in the Nile Delta. That's where the liberals put it so that they can sort of wander across the swampy marshes to get down into the Sinai Peninsula. God put it at an impossible location for the Israelites to get out. The Valley of the Kings is loaded with massive monuments. Much of it is flooded today because they built the Aswan Dam. But, uh, but that was a place that was loaded with monuments, with beautiful sculptured tombs. Yeah, they thought about death but they thought about it the wrong way. Pharaoh didn't think about it in light of what comes after that, really. He subconsciously figured that it would never happen to him, or if it did happen, it would be a long way down the road. How many of you have ever been like that? Like you young people. 
I mean, you probably don't think about death very often, so it's good to stop and think about it once in a while. You probably think, man, I got my whole life ahead of me. Really? You paying attention to what's going on in the United States today? You paying attention to the collapse of the country? You paying attention to what's going on with young people every day who are dying of drug overdoses and in car wrecks because they were drunk? Young people who thought they were healthy and suddenly just dropped dead because they had some kind of a genetic defect. Do you know death is coming? Young people, think about it carefully. Think about it from God's perspective. A lot of young people here today, we, we need to think about that. But when Pharaoh thought about death, he thought about it in terms of how glorious it would be for him. He would have a, a huge tomb. He would have carvings of all of his gods. All the gods would be happy with him. They'd all give him a pat on the back and tell him how great he was. Boy, talk about self-deception. The slaves who buried him would be killed to be his servants in the afterlife. That's the way they did it. His tomb would be loaded with food and gold and jewels and paintings of his great military power and beautiful women and all of his accomplishments. Nobody else got to be buried like that. He was on top. <laughs> on top, if you want to call it that. Hey, it doesn't get any better than this, right? Doing everything, looking forward to that kind of a death. God in his mercy gave Pharaoh ten chances to see that the gods of Egypt were rinky-dink stuffed sausages compared to Jehovah. The plagues were God's judgment on the gods of Egypt. We've read those passages already. When God was judging Egypt, he wasn't just spanking Pharaoh. He was judging the gods of Egypt. And Pharaoh was trusting those gods. Those were the ones that he thought about in terms of his own death. God judged the gods of Egypt. Those gods that Pharaoh thought were so great and powerful and were going to do such wonderful things for him. But Pharaoh wasn't paying attention to the true God who actually revealed himself personally to Pharaoh. You know, that doesn't happen with too many people. It wasn't he was just told about God. God revealed himself personally to Pharaoh. Now, you're not going to get a divine revelation like that. But imagine if it happened, God reveals himself personally to you. Think about the people at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't get much more personal revelation than that. God himself walking on earth and talking and performing miracles and healings, defeating Satan over and over, casting out demons. And that's why Jesus said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin and Bethsaida, and Cabernium and Tiberias. If the works that had been done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have remained unto this day. Imagine that. If Jesus had gone to Sodom and Gomorrah, America is sort of like Sodom and Gomorrah today. If Jesus had gone to Sodom and Gomorrah, they were destroyed in 1800 B.C., they would have still been around at the time of Christ. God didn't go to Sodom and Gomorrah with Jesus. He sent a man by the name of Lot. Peter tells us that that righteous man vexed his soul from day to day. Now, Lot was a sinner, quite obvious from the end of his story. But they didn't listen. Two angels came to Sodom. The men of Sodom could only think lustful thoughts. It was the people that didn't listen. If Jesus had gone, those people would have repented. What if you had a personal encounter with God? How would you respond? They were had that. He saw that God personally revealed himself to Pharaoh. Moses was talking to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had a certain response. Moses said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? God says, stretch out your hand, and here's what's going to happen next. Pharaoh saw it happen. Now, you could say one or two of those are coincidences, but ten in a row with precise timing? That was not a coincidence. 
you know, if you look around you, God is working in your life. He's doing things that if you stop and think about it, are designed for your good and his glory. Do you pay attention? I hope so. You don't want to be in the same category, the same boat that Pharaoh was in when he rejected. See, God was not in Pharaoh's thoughts. David talks about that in the Psalms. He says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. When you get up in the morning and you decide what you're going to do for the day, is God in your thoughts? When you are making your breakfast and deciding what you're going to have for breakfast and then where you're going to go and are primping in front of the mirror, you know, fixing your hair all nice and fancy, getting on your clothes, and squirting that stuff on, you know, make you smell good, is God in your thoughts? He should be in your thoughts every waking moment. When you have options to choose this or that or to do this or that or how to spend your time or with whom you're going to spend your time, is God in your thoughts? God is not in the thoughts of the wicked. They do their own thing. If God is not in your thoughts, you may be in the wrong category of people. That's what Pharaoh was. Paul explains it in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Pharaoh had way too high of an opinion of himself. God was not at all in his thoughts. It tells us in this passage that he was proud. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. It's going to happen, folks. If you put yourself up in pride, you are going to have a fall. And it's going to be a big one. Pharaoh refused to admit that someday he was going to die. Someday he was going to have to stand before the very God who was sending all of those plagues. Someday he would no longer have a chance to repent and be saved. Someday he would have passed, and it can happen for you too, he would have passed the point of no return. The point of no return. There comes a moment when you are suddenly in free fall and there's nothing to grab onto. You've reached the point of no return. You've been walking along the edge of the cliff and thinking it was so cool and how brave you are and you're all proud about it and you take one wrong step and you've reached the point of no return. I hope you haven't gotten there. Someday he would pass that point and someday he would be in hell. How often is the God of the Bible in your thoughts? Do you walk before him in pride or do you walk before him in humility? Here's what God requires. This is not a suggestion. This is his requirement. Micah 6, 8. He has showed the O man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee. Three things. But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Those are not suggestions. Those are things that God requires of us. If you got pride, it knocks out all three of those. If you got pride, you won't do justly. If you got pride, you won't love mercy. If you got pride, you're obviously not walking humbly with your God. Do you know the context in which Micah is writing? Just a show of hands. Within the last six months, no, you get whole six months for this. Within the last six months, how many of you have read through the book of Micah? Raise your hand. <laughs> One person. Fantastic. The book of Micah. A lot of good stuff in the book of Micah. Some incredible messianic prophecies in the book of Micah. But let me give you the context of this verse that I just read you about walking humbly with your God. You know what he's reminding them about in this context? He's reminding them about exactly what we're studying. He's reminding them about the Exodus. I think he probably had Pharaoh in mind. O oh, my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt 
and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses and Aaron and Miriam. That's the context in which he tells thee he hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. You see, what we're studying here, folks, is not merely interesting history. What we're studying is God showing mercy and grace and teaching his people and even showing mercy to the wicked, vile Pharaoh who refused the mercy of God. I hope you never find yourself in Pharaoh's shoes. What we're reading here in Micah is God actually pleading with his people. It's God trying to wake up the people he loves and get them out of the house that's burning down around them while they try to roll over and pull the pillow over their head. Folks, don't pull the pillow over your head. You see the bad things that are happening around you here in the United States? God is pleading with you to wake up and turn back to him with your whole heart. Quit continuing to slog along in the slime pit of carnality. You say, well, I don't count. I'm just one person. Yeah, if everybody thinks that way, what have you got? Everybody is wallowing around in the slime pit of carnality. Each of us needs to take our responsibility. Each of us needs to put on our armor. Each of us needs to pick up our sword. Each of us needs to be involved in the battle for spiritual truth and righteousness and holiness. Don't just say, oh well, let somebody else do it. God's calling us back with our whole heart to be zealous in our love, in our service to Him. And stop making excuses. Stop living in the ghettos of carnality. Remember what we read and covered last week? It told us that the hail smote throughout the land of Egypt, everything that was in the field, man and beast, and it smote every herb of the field and break every tray of the field, but there was no hail in the land of Goshen. It broke down everything and destroyed all the plant life that had grown up. But Pharaoh hardened his heart when he saw that, hey, it had not yet smitten the wheat and the rye because they hadn't grown up yet. You know, those things can grow up overnight. Give them a couple of days and you've got plants that are up there, you know, a foot high. But they hadn't broken the surface of the soil yet. Because God was saving them for another plague, the plague that we've got in front of us today. God was saving them for the, the plague of the locusts. We saw a lot of different things in those passages, but I'm not going to go over them again here. We saw that ground running fire, fascinating stuff, and probably people running around uh, being chased by little fireballs on the ground, uh, kind of an exciting day of adventures. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to have been there while that was going on. We saw that Pharaoh had a limited confession uh, when he made his confession. He, 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 he cuts out some of the limits on the confession that he makes in our passage today, but he had limited confession. I have sinned this time. He doesn't say this time when he, he gets hit with the locusts. I've sinned this time. That's an exclusionary clause in contract law. Second, he tried to shift the blame. He said, I and my people. You notice that Pharaoh is getting a little more tense and uptight in the passage that we've got in front of us today. He's not trying to shift the blame here, but he does harden his heart because he does not want to let them go except the men. Okay, you men can go, but I'm going to guarantee that you come back to me because you're going to leave your wives and kids and flocks here. That'll get the men back. They don't want to leave all their wives and children to Pharaoh. Moses stomps out, doesn't even answer him. And the servants of Pharaoh say, Come on, come on, please, have mercy on us. Don't you realize that that guy, is he's going to go out and he's going to hit us again. So Pharaoh calls him back. He says, Who's going to go with you? Moses tells him. He says, That's not going to be how it can be. It's not going to be that way. You are not going to do it. Get out of here. And so he gets his judgment. Oh, people, stubbornness against God. What it costs us when we're stubborn against God. And you know, God has more than enough hail up there if he wanted to throw it down at us. We saw him doing it in the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 10. 
We see him doing it through many places in the scripture. We find Job talks about the treasures of the hail that God has up in the heavens. We saw last week how God does that, not only in the past, but he has promised to do it in the book of Revelation. The judgments of the hail that are going to come during the trumpet judgments, that are going to come during the bowl judgments are given to us. In Revelation chapter 11 and Revelation chapter 16. It's coming again. We've noted that every one of the judgments that are found in the ten plagues, every one of them shows up again in the book of Revelation. God gave a little warm-up sample in the land of Egypt. The next time he does it, it's going to be over the whole face of the earth. And you know how people are going to respond? They're going to respond exactly like Pharaoh responded. Exactly like Pharaoh responded. They're going to curse God who has the power over all those plagues. In fact, in the book of Revelation, we find two witnesses, and I believe, and they have the power over all those plagues, it says so. I believe one of those is Moses. Some very, very strange things happened at the death of Moses. God buried him. Nobody knows where his burial is. And Jude tells us that Satan wanted to get hold of Moses' body. And he had to fight with the archangel Michael. And Satan's pretty powerful because Michael didn't fight him in his own strength. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. Something about Moses. And you look at these plagues and you suddenly realize they're the same ones. And it's the two witnesses in the book of Revelation of the power of those plagues. The earth doesn't get it. Pharaoh didn't get it. I hope you get it. There's a God in heaven and he has guaranteed that there's going to be judgment. Now I mentioned that there are three stages, three final stages of God's judgment. It happens to people and it happens to civilizations. Stage number one is the removal of every life support. The removal of every life support. We're talking about whole civilizations here, not just individual people, not just people in the hospital. We're talking about people not just in their physical lives but in their spiritual lives. There's a removal of every life support. Here, the locusts ate everything. There's starvation. There's a removal of the life support system. The second thing that we're going to see when we move to the next judgment is utter spiritual blindness because that's the plague of darkness. In fact, it describes that darkness, and we'll talk about it more of the Lord willing next week. It describes that darkness. It's so thick that they could feel it. I mean, that's dark. You stick your hand in front of your face, you can't see it. Oh, I have a lot of exciting things to tell you about that plague of darkness. We'll have to wait till we get there. You know, that's the inability to humanly perceive truth. And that's coming on people today. They have the inability to perceive truth. It's like they have no spiritual eyeballs at all. And the third stage is death. The removal of all future hope. With death comes the removal of all future hope if you're not in the right condition. That's the death of the firstborn. And so as we look here at Exodus chapter 10, we discover the removal of every life support. First, God hardened both the heart of Pharaoh and his servants, not just Pharaoh, because the Pharaoh had seen it, but those servants had seen it, they knew, they understood, and they rebelled and rejected what they knew to be true. God said, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and I'm going to harden the heart of his servants. Did you know that God is still hardening people's hearts today? God does that. God is still hardening people's hearts today, and that there is a day coming when he will personally harden the hearts of almost every living human being on the planet. God is going to do it. You say, where in the Bible is that? Yeah, God is going to harden the hearts of almost every human being on the planet. Not just they're going to harden their hearts. God is going to harden it. It's over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the end days, right? The coming of Christ. That's the introduction to this passage. That you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. See, they, 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 had, they were tuned in. Yeah, Christ is coming. He might be coming any moment. 
But somebody had been telling them, hey, it happened, you missed it. <laughs> you know, the disciples of John, that happened to them over in Acts chapter 19. Uh, they were looking forward to the coming Messiah. They, they believed the message of John. They didn't realize Jesus had come and gone. And here's some people who are basically telling them the same thing about the second coming of Christ. And he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, an apostasia. We get our word apostasy from that. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. This is the Antichrist Paul is describing here. Or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. There's going to be some rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. You know, 75 years ago, people would have said, well, that's not really possible because after all, the Muslims own the land, they own the Temple Mount, they're in control of everything. It's never going to happen. Do you know that about 65, 66 years ago, Israel became a nation and Israel now owns all of that land. There's coming a day when the temple will rebuild. Remember you not when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. That's the Holy Spirit he's talking about there. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, that is hinder, that's the old English for hinder, until he be taken out of the way. And that's going to happen at the rapture. It's not government that's doing the restraining here. It's the Holy Spirit in the believers. And when the believers go, he indwells us, he goes with us. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Remember, Moses is contending with Satan. It's the gods of Egypt that these judgments are coming on. We talked about that like with the Lord of the Flies and so on, when you had the plague of flies. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Think of all these plagues, and Pharaoh and his servants received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now listen, we've been talking about the end times here in 2 Thessalonians, right? You say, okay, so now show it to me where it says that God's going to harden the heart of everybody on the face of the earth, almost everybody anyway. Verses 10 and 11. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There comes a point of no return. There comes a point of falling off the cliff. There comes a point where you're in free fall, where there's nothing you can grab onto. They've been walking along the edge of the cliff, thumbing their nose at God. So God sends them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. They look down and they think there's solid ground and they put their foot out there. That was their strong delusion. They believed the lie. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. God sends them strong delusion and they're in free fall. Dear friends, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said in John chapter 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. If you've got anything that's contrary to the word of God, it's not truth. If you're not studying the word of God, you're not building truth into your life. If you're not memorizing, meditating on the word of God, you do not have a foundation of truth. and you'll be subject to believing lies. This is your inoculation against lies. This is the vaccination that you need so that you get, don't catch the swine flu of lies. Are you making it part of your life every day? Do you take it in every day? You take it like you're eating your, your oranges and your apples and all the good stuff that keeps you healthy? I hope so. Second thing that we learn here is that God's purpose was to teach future generations about his character, his power, his nature, and his sovereignty. 
Our job as parents and grandparents is to teach our children and grandchildren so that they will not rebel against God like Pharaoh and his servants rebelled. Did you catch that in verse 2? It says, And that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son. That's your kids and your grandkids. Now, some of you are too young to have kids yet, and some of you are too young to have grandkids yet, but believe me, you'll get there <laughs> if you live. You're supposed to be teaching it. God says, the reason I'm doing this to Pharaoh, and I've shown him mercy ten times, though he's hardened his heart sometimes, and I've hardened his heart sometimes, I'm doing it so that you, who are my children, can teach your children and teach your grandchildren. This is practical, folks. What kind of a program have you installed? Now, mine are almost all out of the house at this point. Only got one left. But you know what? Every time I'm with her, I try to teach her something. Now, she doesn't always listen. <laughs> she's 20 years old, and she's, uh, you know, she's pretty bright, and she's pretty independent, but, but my job is to teach. 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 And dear friends, that's your job too. It only takes one generation where the parents fail to teach their children. Only one generation for the nation to plunge into utter destruction. One generation. Aren't you thankful that there are those who have gone before us who taught us the truth? Who stood firm in the face of the enemy? Who are willing to lift the sword and the shield in battle? Pass it on. Pass it on. That thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son and of thy son's son what things I have wrought in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them that you may know how that I am the Lord. We got through two of seven points. <laughs> it's quite all right. We'll be continuing, I suppose, next week with our study here. But believe me, folks, this is critical because this is America today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the power of your word. How we thank you that it, it warns us, it reminds us, it chastens us. It gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. It woos us. It gives to us glorious pictures of your grace. But at some point, we either need to believe and obey, or else we go into free fall. Father, thank you once again for the privilege that we've had of looking into the scriptures today. We pray that you'll encourage our hearts, that you'll bless us with greater understanding, and that you'll bless us with greater obedience. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 619.